This is how the hot dog fairy saved the entire Lehigh Valley. And on Tuesdays in July, hot dogs at Potts were only one dollar. I gotta find out how the hot dog fairy does this. Welcome to Potts. What can I get you? Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, and sometimes Emmaus. Welcome to the Lehigh Valley with Love Podcast. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to this episode of the Lehigh Valley with Love Podcast. Tyler. Yes, George. Have you seen any good movies lately? I did. I did. I've seen some some good movies on Netflix, but my favorite one I just saw, Billboard. Billboard. You know what? I, it's it's very local oriented. Our buddy uh, Zeke Zelker, who we've had on, not the show, not the television show. I love your segues, by the way. The uh, the podcast itself. <laughs> what? Tyler, have you seen any good? Mo- we just <laughs> talked about this before. Like, all right, I let's talk you'd... about the Billboard movie. I, I figured you'd segue. like you'd like br- you'd bring it in like, like casually. Hey, have you? Can we talk about that thing we were just talking about? I thought that was good. So <laughs> very, very very well done, George. If you're not familiar with the Billboard movie. Um, Google it. It's directed by our friend Zeke Zelker. It's loosely based on the um, the billboard in the early '80s. These these guys sat on a billboard to win like a house. No, it was money in a, an RV. A house. Yeah, Wasn't it a house? I think, uh, the, I think the, it was a house. Well, well I mean, the Zeke, movie's a little he, different. He adapted it to present time. Mm-hmm. So there was a there was like a, a social media flair to it, which would have been interesting Back in that in time day. period. And actually, I went uh, Steel Stacks. On Friday, had the screening, and Zeke did a Zeke did a Q and A after, and okay. one of the original Billboard sitters was there. Was he? Well, yeah. How was he doing? <laughs> he's doing fine, I guess. He's still living yeah. in that RV. I think. No, I <laughs> really? I don't know, but um, I you know it was a good movie. So check it out whenever you get a chance. It's got if Lea Valley people, you're gonna see a lot of uh, stuff that you that you'll recognize. And here, here's something that's gonna really make you want to see the movie. I'm in it. You are in it. For 0.5 seconds. Yeah. Well, your daughter's in it, which is the the saving grace, but what, your face is in it as well. <laughs> What's funny is that they're like, George, uh, we, need to, we need to do a quick scene with people on their phones on yeah. social media. At so a they bar. Call, yeah, they're like, a, well, who would, who would nail this for all? With a child. <laughs> it was a bayou, so it wasn't like in a bar or yeah, a George, restaurant. George uh, typecast, for sure. But more importantly, we have a guest. We have a guest here. Very excited to bring... Uh, Local native writer, uh, Jack McCallum. Jack, thanks for coming. Welcome, welcome. I wasn't, I'm sorry I'm dressed like this, <laughs> which is to say exactly like them. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, it's already, we're, we're one, um, I got a phone One call. insult in. How would you, uh, George, this nope. is not the time, I I'll don't think. I'll put this away. Maybe you don't answer the phone during the television I just show. Can't, that I just can't, like an emergency. So, Jack McCallum, um, People will probably know you from Sports Illustrated and books you've written with Michael Jordan and Kobe, right? No, not with uh, with some other people, but I mean, I covered those. Okay, I covered those guys. I certainly covered Michael. Yeah, I did a book on the Dream Team, which included oh, yes. Michael. And had Michael been involved uh, financially, it would have been I would have made more money. <laughs> but it was, yeah. but it was okay. He would have put a swoosh on it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. But uh, you're but you're a Bethlehem guy. I'm actually not a native. I I've been here for so damn long, long. I feel yeah. like I'm a New Jersey. Oh really? I'm, yeah, I'm one of the few people ever actually born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, <laughs> pre casino at Frank Sinatra <laughs> Hospital. I'm not making that up. So I came up and uh, went to Muhlenberg in 1967. So I basically been here since. I had a couple jobs that moved me away temporarily, but and then you. Muhlenberg, the journalism was the major. Is that what you? No, they writing? didn't have. They, I never had. The only journalism course I ever had back then, they had. Uh, you know, I was back in the era when you had English, <laughs> <laughs> history. <Yeah. laughs> you know, uh, I'm I'm exaggerating that a little bit, but they did not have a communications major, and I was you know going to major in English because I was too dumb in <laughs> math and science. So between my junior and senior year, I went up to Boston, uh, basically because my uh, girlfriend was going up there, and who's now my wife, so I can say that. And, <laughs> you know, I washed dishes at the Pewter Pot Muffin House, and I took a course in, at BU, Boston University, in journalism. And that was the only course I ever had, and I was, I was just really good in it. Uh-huh. That, I found out this is what I could do. So I came back, and I knew that's what I wanted to do, and I I talked my way into a job at the Globe Times 
halfway through my senior year in the most sort of incredible fashion. Well, and one of my how fa- well, I want to hear that. Well, yeah, one of, yeah, well, tell that because like one of my favorite things is how you go from the Globe Times, which doesn't exist anymore. You got wrapped into the uh, Express Times, right? So they so, bought it, or? more or less, sort of. But it's it's kind of not it's not the same entity as right. the Express Times. But I had I was halfway through my senior year, like a lot of kids, I had ran out of money, and uh, I was working at the East Penn Foundry in McCundry or something like part part time. <laughs> And I said, geez, I got to get, I got to do something. I called up the morning call. They just laughed at me. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) they said there's a paper in Bethlehem. And I swear, you know, this is how you are when you're a provincial college kid back then. I I don't know whether I had ever been to Bethlehem from from (laughs) New York. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. Uh, You know, I mean, I played basketball over at at Moravian, uh, you know, where George's alma mater. And uh, I... I somehow talked to John Strohmeyer, who was the editor of the Globe Times, who later the next year won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing. Really? I mean, he was a brilliant journalist. And he said, yeah, come on over. We had an opening. And this was a joke. Jack <laughs> is leaving the fraternity house on Friday. My hair is long. <laughs> you know, I had been up playing uh, Pinochle till 6 a.m. Yeah. It was a joke. Yeah. Jack, Crazy Muhlenberg days. <laughs> yeah. Watch out. And I, I walked in, and the sports editor, it happened to be in sports. I didn't know what the job was in. And uh, Jack Collins, who owned the old brewery tavern, was also the sports editor. And he <laughs> starts talking to me, smoking a cigarette. I could do a Jack Collins imitation, but that won't help you guys. And Jack starts, and I'm lying my <laughs> off. Yeah, oh, yeah, I was editor of the yearbook. And not really. No, I worked at the, I didn't even work at the school newspaper. I, at <laughs> Muhlenberg Weekly because So you're was, just BSing? I'm BS. Uh, but never did I not think that I couldn't do this. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I never didn't think Because they're going to figure out pretty quickly if you don't know how to Because you, had, to comp- you had confidence in yeah, your ability. I, I did have confidence in my ability, even though, as you'll find out, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So Jack says, uh, Jack names an English professor at Muhlenberg who used to drink at his bar. And because every English department has the guy that drank too much. At somebody's bar. Yeah. <laughs> That's like sure. in movies. That's like, like those guys are is, yeah. is the wealth of information. Yeah. From. Had I become an English professor, <laughs> that's what I might have been that guy. Anyway, so I said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I had, uh, I had." I'm not going to say his name, but and Jack looks at me. I'm not making this up, and he goes, "Go next door, uh, Bethlehem Sporting Goods was right across the street, mm-hmm. Fourth mm-hmm. Street. It's now you know right where the tally ho is." Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, pick up a scoring book. You're hitting the Becca High game tonight. Tonight. <laughs> You're like, wait, I got a pinnacle. I got a pinnacle. I got, I got, I got a frat. I got. <laughs> and my first question was, what's a Becca High? I had no <laughs> clue what was going on. And so I, Jack took me to the game, introduced me to the Bethlehem Catholic basketball coach. I'll never forget Bobby Buckfitt starts hollering at me. I said, I, I don't even know who you are. Why, <laughs> why are you hollering at me? I'm not responsible for the crappy right. coverage you said that we got before. So I went back I'm the to new the guy. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> went back to the fraternity house, and Jack said, write five takes on the game. And I'm back there with my, my friends playing Pinochle going, <laughs> what do you think a take is? Yeah. <laughs> and we figured out, we thought it was like every time you change, it, like a transition. So I ended up with one and a half pages of copy. I had to be in at 6.30 in the morning. And I'm there at 6.30. Everybody's looking at me like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> I'm just sitting there like this. And Jack Collins doesn't come in until like 8 o'clock. <laughs> and he says, uh, so you got that story? I go, yeah. And I hand him my pathetic one. He goes, I thought I told you to write five takes. I go, I, I didn't know what a take was. <laughs> it's five pages. <laughs> so I quickly, you know, knocked it out and... That day, now you have to think of this a second. One day you're a college kid, sure. you kind of need a yeah. job. The next day you have a byline yeah. in yeah. a paper. I mean, it was like from that moment on, I mean, that's why the early, you know, in journalism, uh, at least it used to be the case. I mean, you didn't have to get paid crap because you, you're you getting paid in bylines. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're nobody, and then all of a sudden you're yeah. And it's even, I mean, that, that story is crazy, right? Yeah. In, in terms how? of how they... But then to go from even that, you know, the Bethlehem Globe Times, people revere, but, it, you know, let's be honest, it's a little small, to 
how does your transition to writing for Sports Illustrated? I mean, well, I mean, you you know, it is, as it turned out, the sport, uh, the basketball Globe Times was a kind of place where you got dumped in the pool. I mean, the, the proverbial here. Let's see if you learn how to swim. There were there were some nutty people all around, but there were some really great journalists. A good friend of mine became Glenn Grantley, became the editor of mm-hmm. the uh, of the Morning Call edit pages. For when I was in your class, he came in and talked to yeah. us. Yeah, I remember. That. I mean. Uh, Glenn had gone through four years of journalism at Penn State, and I, he, I mean, he knew stuff I didn't know. All I had was that I could write, and I sort of had the perfect background to be a sports writer. I was an athlete, but not a great one. I understood the game, and so there was a softball pitcher around here, then named Ty Stofflet. Are you guys too young to remember? I don't remember. Ty do Stofflet was. Yeah. The greatest. He had just come back from the world championship of softball where he had struck out 26 of 27 guys. Oh, okay. And he was a mechanic at Mack Truck, but he just happened to be the best softball pitcher in the world. And I said, I suggested this uh, story. And back then, Sports Illustrated was this thick, (laughs) and they ran these kind of stories all the time. I mean, today, I had been there for 30 years. If I asked to write that story today, they would probably say no. But back then, I was a total nobody. And they said, okay, you can try the story. And I, I wrote a really nice story. And I just never forget, I'm sitting at my desk at the Globe Times. Somebody comes in with, with Sports Illustrated, one of the guys that worked in the press room. And he unfolds it. He goes, you won't believe this. There's a guy with your name, <laughs> I swear this is true, that wrote a story on this local softball pitcher. Like, what are the odds? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what are the odds? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, that was me. He goes, it's not you. Yeah. It's not you. They're like, we've seen your writing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, uh, you know, began a relationship there and had a couple other jobs. I mean, I worked at the morning, but I always kept up a relationship with SI. I wrote probably 10 or 11 freelance articles and then got hired in uh, 1981, the day before I was supposed to go to spring training to cover the Phillies as the beat writer for the Philadelphia Bulletin. So I've worked for four newspapers and killed three of them. (laughs) What was the first moment that you can remember when you started covering elite athletes where were you did you ever like have to think to not become a fan cuz and cuz the level of play was so big how did you become stay like and, objective and in the reporting it, on top of that it's interesting too cuz like you started like 81 that's when um i feel maybe it's just cuz that's kind of when i was growing up but it feels like that's when sports became more of a more mainstream i guess yeah that's when like the legends it started are, building up yeah. you know people your age and even younger seemed to realize that that really was a special time, mm-hmm. that oh, yeah. that group of people really does, to a certain extent, they're being not supplanted, but they're being complemented by Kobe, LeBron, Curry, Durant, now Harden. To a certain extent, those guys, Westbrook, those guys have ascended to a certain level. But for people that follow the game, your age and younger, they still see them as an evolution of these uh, older guys. Mm -hmm. So to a certain extent, fortunately, Mm -hmm. I never really became irrelevant. I mean, Charles Jordan still owns a team. Charles Barkley is a major cultural figure in the United Mm -hmm. States. Uh, Larry Magic Johnson. Magic, who just, Magic's in the news right now. (laughs) You know, I'm trying to get in touch with him on the phone for Monday, as a matter of fact. These guys are so Dude, you want to call him right now? Call him right now. Put him on speaker. FaceTime him. I don't. I got a <laughs> lot of cells. Yeah. I don't have. I got Magic's guy who's always right next to him. You, you have these. Well, I could go through my. Well, that's a great because in story, like, full disclosure, we've both like I, I've been a student in, in your class at Moravian. And one class in particular, we were sitting there and you're like, hey, and this is 2000, whatever, early 2000s. Probably. Um, and you're like, you know, I'm really sorry. I have my cell phone, and I'm gonna have it to keep it up here. Because back then, like, cell phones weren't as big, so it was even although more... there was a, a woman in your class who followed the Yankees play by play on her <laughs> computer, uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I don't remember like, her name. <laughs> well, at least she's like dedicated. <laughs> yeah. She's in the right class. Um, but you're like, I, you know, I gotta keep it here. And then it rings, and you're like, yep, that's. 
And I think it was something like, all right, class is dismissed. And we're like, we're not going anywhere. Like, <laughs> well, who was on call. the phone? It, I believe it was Michael Jordan. He definitely, <laughs> either he was calling or something, but I remember that like very clearly. It was just, yeah, it was it just crazy to me. Like, it was a moment, like, this is happening. Uh-huh. Well, well part, part of it, I mean, part of what, another reason I was lucky, the sixth reason, was that when I was doing this, I mean, I think I'm not going to be too, you know, disingenuous. I think those guys trusted me. They thought I was fair. But part of it was the power of Sports Illustrated. I mean, Jordan... Never bigger. Jordan liked to be on the cover, understood what it did for the word we now use, his brand. You know, Mm -hmm. he understood that more than I did. I mean, when I got to SI, I knew it was a big deal because it was SI, but I never quite understood why it was that big until I realized how many people read the thing and what and you know it's funny right now the SI business is not good at all but this brand still remains yeah. the brand is so incredible but I bet you you guys don't read it or I bet you well, nobody I, I went um, I don't read it I haven't read it. I, I get it on my tablet to be honest with you I got <laughs> that's so crazy you get the <laughs> The web, do you get the website or the magazine? I get the magazine, get the magazine. delivered to me on Amazon. I on bought, your tablet. Well, here's why I bought it. They, they roped me in with that um, when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Uh-huh. They're like, if you get a, a year subscription, we're going to throw in this book, which I've never read, this coat I've never worn. But they did give me a sweet commemorative football <laughs> um, to get. Anyway, long story short, it is kind of nice to get it on your tablet. How I does do that, still read it from time to time. How does that make you feel? It's Somebody a that wrote world. words that appeared in paper. Well, still SI. do, now but people are reading it like, just on the yeah. tablet. Does that does that well, make you feel? Uh, P, uh, you know, there was a tough transition for for people like me. There, there. You know, it was the year two thousand. I remember this specifically. I was at the Olympics in Sydney, and I wrote a story about Rulon Gardner, who was this crazy the wrestler, wrestler right? yeah. who Did beat, he lose his toes or something. Yeah, he was yeah. A, like a farmer from yeah, yeah. South <laughs> Dakota who had lost that. his toe in a mowing accident, and he beats Alexander Karelin who had literally never lost, you know? Yeah. And he beat him and won the gold medal. And I remember, holy crap, this is a great story. I did all this research, and SI was coming out, like, unfortunately, like seven, eight days later. And I wrote this great story about, about Rulon Gardner. But then I went to Rulon Gardner's uh, party, and I had to write something quickly for the website. So what I wrote for the website was all about Corellin, the guy that he beat, because I was saving Rulon Gardner. Mm. And I will never forget that 60 of Rulon Gardner's agrarian uh, relatives <laughs> walk in with the SI.com thing and go, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, we have a story this long about uh, this guy that he beat. Where's all the stuff about Rulon? Which it was at that moment that everything changed for me that I realized people don't want to wait nine days mm-hmm. for my beautiful prose yeah. about Rulon Gardner. They want 20 inches of something quickly. And so that that was yeah. really a, and, a turnabout. And, and, what, what's, what's always, um, like, like, been crazy to me is that you have, like, you're this white guy from, you know, well, Atlantic City and then Bethlehem, and you get such quality time with these athletes in the NBA that are so that are not di- white guys from well, yeah, they're just it's a different. It's a, there it is, there it's should totally be a culture. cultural I mean, divide, is, is but there doesn't seem to be a cultural divide based on the information that you get and you, the stories that you tell in these books. What have you done, or what do you think? What do you attribute that to? Where you can uh, get these guy, get these athletes comfortable with somebody that's not who they would typically. Yeah. Well, I think now it's it's a pretty simple answer. When I was younger, more like your guys' age in the 80s, I mean, I took over the NBA beat when I was 34 or something like that. I started to say this before. What I, what I meant to say was that the guys back then, even though they were famous, understood kind of the relationship with mm-hmm. the media. I had fights, disputes over the years with Jordan, and every, but they forgot it. It was part of the game. Right. It was part of the game. So I, I got that reputation from those guys. Th- that's where my reputation came from. It's like, a, it's like respect, because if they respect you, then they're willing to put up with a little Correct. bit of... Correct, and a little bit of it was the power of SI, but they did respect me. They thought I did a good job. Well, now what happens later was that the guys like uh, Steph and Kevin Durant, I had to deal with, with my latest book, 
now I'm up to a certain Kobe. Uh, not LeBron so much. I wasn't. I, I didn't do that much on LeBron. I was sort of fading, kind of semi-retiring. I did a couple stories on LeBron, but to those guys, I'm the guy that covered Michael Magic yeah, yeah. Larry. Right. I'm that. I'm that guy. Yeah, you grandfathered in. Yeah, I'm, I, cool. exactly. They knew who I was from that. Uh, KD, I did a story on him, like when he first came in, and I I remember it was 2007, I guess. And so then I was going to talk to him 10 years later. I'm not sure I had seen him since. And he comes over, and I started the rise. He goes, man, you know, that was my first story in SI that you wrote. So That's crazy. Yeah. He, wasn't, he wasn't going to forget yeah, that. Yeah, he didn't forget not that. Not because he loves me so much, but he, he, he would I never guess, forget that. You know what? I guess you think, too. Like, I think Kevin Durant, like, they, they, don't, they don't care that I'm in sports that they're in sports illustrated but uh, they, they, do. Have, they, they definitely have do i guess yeah not, i guess I didn't they like it they way. like when the nice things are said about them and also they probably respect ha, have you ever had a situation where uh like a like a legend or like uh, a larger than life character you've had to say something not so flattering about and that you've had interactions with them after oh all the time i mean it happened all the time i had an i had a big argument with with michael jordan i was going to uh <laughs> You know, he. I went over to his house, and his girlfriend, who later became his wife, comes down with his with a child. And you do all this research. Be, this is before the internet, but this is 88, 89, 90. And you do all this research, and I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, I didn't know Michael. Nobody had written Michael had a, a, a child. And I'm holding the baby. You know, baby's yeah. peeing on me, and I'm <laughs> talking about my kids who were a lot <laughs> older by then. But all this, and I go to the game that night, and... Uh, the public relations director for the Bulls comes over and says, you know, Michael expects that you won't mention that he has a child. <laughs> to me, it wasn't a moral issue. It wasn't. I said, well, you know, I'm holding the child. And, <laughs> and I just thought that Michael was just trying to show his power so much. I can show you any damn thing I want to. And then after the and fact, I control it. yeah, I control you totally, which I get it. I mean, part of his, you know, he's Michael Jordan and everything. And we had a talk about it. He was going to New York. He said, well, you better go see Michael. And I went and saw him. And I just said, you know, I just don't think there's certain things I see that I keep out. Believe me. Right. A lot of things. <laughs> and you have to decide. That's one of the things about journalism. You know, those rules are not written. You don't go, oh, yeah, that's 6A that you always you never write. Mm-hmm. You have to decide according to what the situation is. Uh, wh- what are the ramifications going to be when this Obviously, comes out? Actually, ramifications are part of it. There's no question about it. What is your previous relation? How much do you need? Do I ever want to talk to this guy ever again? Yeah. Yeah. And I just and my editor said for some strange reason, I'll leave it up to you. And I put it into the story, not like Michael Jordan has a love child because I don't care. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people have. Yeah, you weren't you weren't TMZ. It was not a more, it, to me, it was not a moral issue. It, it didn't have anything to do with it. Was it a scoop issue? Ten percent, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. But it was more that I was part of the fabric of this afternoon that we were talking about. And yeah, Michael was upset about it, but he got over. He got over because people got people got over stuff. The one thing Michael never got over was that this wasn't me, but Sports Illustrated wrote a story when he went into minor league baseball. Mm-hmm. And the cover said, bag it. I, I remember that. Yeah. And to this day, I've talked to Michael, you know, 10 times since then, but he won't talk to Sports Illustrated. Is there any story that somebody watching right now is like, what's your, do you have any stories that interactions with some of, uh, like a legend that hasn't been, not not like under the radar thing, but like a cool well, I'll probably tell you one. I was when I was finishing up the Dream Team book. This is 2010 or 11. The book came out in 2012. No, it was in 2012. Um, I had finished the Dream Team book, and my goal on the Dream Team book was to interview all the guys in the Dream Team face to face, fly out, you know, like we're doing here. You can't talk to somebody on the phone. I could go into 45 minutes on why that's not as good. But mm-hmm. sure. when you do a podcast with no, somebody we, on the radio, oh, we know. Yeah. good. Yeah, it's not, it's not even close. It's yeah. just not as good. So I had gotten everybody. The book was in galleys. That means that it was f- almost finished. You're not supposed to make a lot of changes unless, you know, there's some emergency. But I still hadn't gotten Bird. Uh, he, uh, he canceled. Something happened. He was 
avoiding me a little, <laughs> even though we had got I, I can't remember why. So I call up uh, his his secretary and I just said, tell Larry that I am going in for my prostate cancer operation next week. And if I die on the table, my last thought is that Bird did not talk to me for this book. Swear to God, that's true. You guilted Larry Bird. <laughs> so the secretary says, uh, hold on, because she had talked to me 30 times by then. Bird gets on it. You have, what do you want? I said, I got to talk to you. He goes, all right, go ahead. I said, no, I got to talk to you in person. I have to talk to you in person. All right, come out month. I said I got to do it Monday because, honest to God, I am going in for this operation. <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't making it up. Yeah, yeah. it was true. And uh, I remember I paid like a crap load of money for this flight. You ever try to get a flight from last <laughs> town? <Allentown? laughs> I think like seven hundred dollars or something. So I go out there, and and Bird is as all the guys were. He was, fan- I mean, he was unbelievable. He was fantastic. Anyway, so I got done, and I called up my editor. And I said, look, I don't know what this is going to cost, but I will just make Larry Bird the last chapter of the book. Right. So we can add on rather okay. than cha- – yeah. I had to change a couple things in the middle due to what he said. But I said, we're going to make this the last chapter of the book. So people have said to me, ah, that was so great, that ending with uh, ending with Larry Bird. I go, yeah, it was partly, <laughs> it was partly because I had to. But it just ended up working, uh, working pretty well. Yes. And is that is that just called the Dream Team? That book? That book's called. It's called. It's funny you said that because they were battling me on the Dream Team. Right. And I said no. It's just got to be called Dream Team. Okay. Dream Team. They're making a documentary out of it, by the way. They made one for NBA TV, but one of them they're using my book, and it's supposed to be on uh, BET next year because yeah. BET said. We need more programming with people that look like Jack McCallum. <laughs> <laughs> one of their goals. Well, be, before well, we before we let you go, I need to just a quick one name answer. Uh oh. LeBron or Jordan? Who's the greatest of all time? I, or is it too? I'm complex? allowed to only say, as they say in the well, congressional it's, hearings, it's a yes or no answer. But <laughs> I, I have to say, Michael, is it partly because I covered him? Probably, but all I would say is, if you, I know Jordan and I know LeBron. And you could go through gift by gift. LeBron may have the advantage. Better shooter percentage-wise. Definitely a better passer. Controls the ball better. But if you put those two guys in a gym and the winner was going to walk out after 75 hours, to me, Jordan, just Jordan walks out. He didn't Mike. quit and he didn't lose. He, he he walked, and he played it as sport. You have to remember the differences in the sport. Was, uh, they beat you up? Uh, Michael's. Yeah. I always say Michael played on a court like this. LeBron played on a court like this with the three-point shots and everything. That doesn't. If somebody else said LeBron, I would not even engage them in an argument. <laughs> I wouldn't. It's just that's my opinion, and I hate to get into here's the reasons because then you end up right. denigrating one, which I. The sound guy fantastic. shaking his head out there. I know. <laughs> I've almost people go, "How can you say?" I said, "Well, I said it. You know, you can you can say what." See, I, still, I, I yeah. still think AI was the most exciting thing. I've I'm going to take Jack McCallum's life. word for it. Okay. No, if I have to, if I'm going to lead with, <laughs> you know, who, my, my buddies from home who go with LeBron, I think I would take six uh, six finals. Well, hey, we want right. to we want to thank you for yeah. coming on. I, I hope you, I hope you can come on again. Yeah, this is I, awesome. like, I feel like there's a lot we didn't even get to, so we appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, so it was, the the, fun, the, the most recent book is the the Golden Days, right? That came out. In, uh, so people can still get that. Is there yeah. like a website that people can? Uh, well, I like to say my website, but I haven't looked at it in six months. So just go just Google, on, Google Jack. Just Google. Google. Just go on the normal places. There's some of my, uh, <laughs> some of the books there, and they're still uh, still available. Awesome, Jack. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching the Lehigh Valley with Love podcast, filmed at the PPL Public Media Center at PBS 39.